Hi, my name is Tom Hull. I'm an associate professor of mathematics at Western New England University, and I've been invited to the carriage house of the Mathematical Association of America to give a distinguished lecture. Uh, specifically, my talk today is going to be on folding a new tomorrow, origami meets math and science. It's very exciting. I've been doing origami since I was eight years old, a small child, um, when an uncle of mine gave me an origami book, and I loved it. I immediately thought it was cool and surprisingly easy to do. I guess I was a very visual, spatial person, and I loved doing things with my hands, and so I loved origami. At the same time, I loved math all throughout school. I loved you know, multiplying numbers together. I was good at it, and, uh, that, and those interests continued kind of in parallel until I was in college, and then started thinking, hey, you know, um, or actually it was a lot earlier when I first looked at an origami model. Like, for example, um, I have a lot of models on the table here. Um, this is one of the more simple origami models and one of the more classic ones. It's the classic Japanese crane or flapping bird. Um, and origami can be simple like this or it can be really complicated. Uh, like, well, here is an origami stegosaurus invented by an American paper folder named John Montrall. And uh, John Montrall has also made an origami zebra. <laughs> This is a, a piece of paper that's black on one side and white on the other. And, and this is folded from a square piece of paper with no cuts at all. It's just cleverly folded so that the black side of the paper makes stripes. It's kind of amazing. And there are other models on the table that I'll talk about. But I remember being young, getting back to my story of origami and math. I remember being very young and taking a model like this crane and thinking, yay, I folded a crane again. And, uh, thinking, well, maybe I should unfold it. And if I unfold the crane, basically going backwards on the instructions you would find in, the, in a book to fold it. So I unfold the, the head and the tail, the neck and the tail, and then I undo the wings. And then you look at the paper, and it has all the creases in it that you've made. And I remember looking at this when I was around 12 years old and saying, wow, look at all those lines. There's clearly some geometry here. There's something going on. There's something about these creases that make this work. I had no idea what it was, but I figured it was something, and it was probably something having to do with geometry. So maybe that's why I also continued to be interested in math, because there seemed to be this connection between math and origami. I didn't really explore that too much until I was in college and started finding some references to it, but there weren't that many. And so when I was in graduate school, getting a PhD in mathematics, I started getting more into it. Uh, 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 Alongside of my graduate studies, <laughs> I was trying to get a PhD in graph theory. Um, I was also studying origami and learning as much as I could about it and publishing about it and stuff. And uh, it turns out there are theorems having to do with origami and paper folding. So like, for example, um, you, know, you know, this model I just unfolded, this, uh, this flapping bird, this crane. It turns out that if you look at the creases that this makes, uh, that any origami model makes that can fold flat. So remember, when I folded the whole crane, it kind of looked like this. And kind of looked like this. And this is what's called a flat origami model, because I can press it in a book without crumpling, as opposed to 3D models like some of these others on the table. But this, this is flat. And most models in origami books that you see are flat like this. It's just a little easier. Well, it turns out that any crease pattern from a flat origami model can be uh, two face colored. That is, if I was to take that crease pattern, and draw all the crease lines, then you can always uh, color the regions between the creases um, in two colors so that no two regions that border on a crease line have the same color. That's what's called two coloring. And this is useful for origami. So you can, back, you can prove that. You can study origami theory and actually prove that anything that you can fold flat, if you unfold it, draw the crease pattern, you'll always be able to color it like this. But that coloring has a really nice property. So you can imagine what would this coloring look like if I refolded the crane. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to refold it. And we're going to ask ourselves, what's this going to look like when I fold it all back? There it is. And as you can see, all pieces, all sides of the paper, all regions of the paper pointing in this direction are blue, whereas on the other side, all the ones pointing in the opposite direction are gray. And that makes sense, right? Because in our coloring, wherever we had a crease, we had two different colors. And wherever there's creases, that's going to make the two regions point in opposite directions. So the two coloring kind of tells you what direction 
the sides of the paper are going to point in. And that's kind of cool. That's a mathematical theorem. That's something that tells you something about the structure of origami in a purely mathematical sense. So that's one of the things we study in origami mathematics. Really kind of neat. Um, and there's a lot of theorems like this. But there's also a lot of different types of origami models. And uh, so to get back to the show and tell aspect, many of the things on this table are made from one piece of paper, but lots of them are made from multiple pieces of paper. And so uh, origami made from multiple pieces of paper are called modular origami pieces. And so like this is an example. This is made from 30 pieces of paper. Uh, each piece of paper is folded in exactly the same way, and they lock together, kind of like Legos, um, with no tape or glue to form interesting objects, usually polyhedral objects. So this is basically a dodecahedron made from 30 units of paper. These are, this is made out of something called the Fizz Unit. stands for Pentagon Hexagon Zigzag Unit, and that describes kind of how the unit works. But as you can see, it makes lots of pentagon holes, and that's what allows it to make a dodecahedron. But the same unit can make other things. So 30 of them make this object, and that's kind of nice. I've actually colored it so that no two units of the same color touched. You can always do that. There's another theorem there. But this is also made from the same unit, except this has 120 units. Yeah, a lot more of them. So now, in order to make it bigger, I had to have pentagons, like there's a pentagon right here. But also, mixed in with the pentagons are hexagons. In fact, there's a lot more hexagons in this than there are pentagons. This unit makes pentagons and hexagons very easily. If you try to make other things, it gets a little more complicated. So that's why I call it the pentagon hexagon zigzag unit. Here, the coloring is a little different. Here, the blue on this coloring is tracing out something called a Hamilton cycle on this polyhedral object. You can look that up and learn more math if you want. But this Viz unit can also make other interesting objects. So as opposed to making things like spheres, this one's making a donut, or what mathematic mathematicians like to call a torus. Yes, this is also colored with three colors, just like the first one was. You can do that too. There's another theorem slash conjecture embedded in there. Yeah. Um, I forget. I think this is made out of uh, <laughs> 81 units, 81 pieces of paper. Yeah. So that's modular origami. There are, there are other things here. This is another modular origami unit, although this one is made from, this is made with 60 pieces of paper. And the paper is red on one side, black on the other. That's how it's getting the interesting look. And uh, yeah. And I like this because if you focus on the red, it looks like the red is tracing out ribbons around it. And that's totally an illusion. <laughs> it's not really happening. It's just the use of the one side versus the other side of the piece of paper that's making it look like that. And some mathematical properties that allow that to actually work and create the illusion of ribbons being traced out on the object. Kind of fun. Um, but there are other models here that are made from one piece of paper that are strictly geometrical, that aren't animals or anything. Um, here is one. This is a rather, this is a model I like to teach my Calc 3 students whenever I'm teaching Calc 3. This is a hyperbolic paraboloid. It's a 3D surface that can be made by the equation z equals x squared minus y squared. Uh -huh. It's actually an approximation of that uh, saddle point or what we call a hyperbolic paraboloid. What's neat about this is that in concept, this is a very easy thing to fold. If I was to spread it apart so you can see the crease pattern, it is all concentric squares. But you can kind of see that. In the center, there's a small square, then another square bigger than that, then another square bigger than that. And that's all the crease pattern is, together with the diagonals of the original square. And so it turns out that if you just take a square piece of paper and fold concentric squares into it, making them alternate so that they go mountain, valley, mountain, valley. Mountain creases go up. Valley creases go down. So you want them to alternate like that, and then get it all to collapse, get all those squares to fold, and the paper will want to make this strange shape, this hyperbolic paraboloid shape. It's really kind of interesting. So it's a nice way of having people actually fold a 3D surface and therefore know, feel what it is like rather than just trying to visualize it. But it's also neat because dynamically, this, this model has two states. I can have these two corners of the paper poking up and the other two poking down, or I can flip it. And that's just something you can always do with this. It's, there are these two tension states. So you can study the physics of this model as well to see you know, why is that happening? Why does it snap like that? And then if, you're, if you want to have even more fun, you can, you can say, well, what if I don't use a square? What if I use a hexagon and make concentric hexagons instead of concentric squares? And if you do that, you get this little monkey saddle thing. 
yay. And all of a sudden, it's not as rigidly dynamic as that is. This one's much more flowy. Whoa, and you can get some really interesting shapes with this. But it is nothing but concentric hexagons folded from an original hexagon piece of paper. Of course, to do that, you actually have to create a relatively perfect hexagon piece of paper. And there's math behind that, too. You can do that by taking a square piece of paper and folding it a certain way, if you want. Um, there's some other models here that have to do with, uh, well, let's see. So there's another genre of origami that has to do with something called tessellation folds. And that's where your crease pattern is a regular tiling of the plane, like a tiling you might see on a bathroom floor or something like that. And it, what's amazing is that there are origami models whose crease patterns are regular tilings, and they sometimes have really neat properties. So for example, this is one of the more famous ones. This is called the Miura map fold, or the Miura Ori. It was invented by a Japanese astrophysicist named Koryo Miura. And he wanted uh, to devise a way to put really big solar panels into outer space. And think about that. You can't just take, take a huge solar panel and stick it on a satellite rocket and shot it, shoot it off into space. It'll fall off or smash or something. So what you want to do is collapse it into a really small object, stick it on inside your satellite to put it on top of a rocket, shoot it off into outer space, and then have a way that it can unfold itself, because no human hands are going to help this. So we do something called, we want something that will self-fold or self-unfold. And this works really well like that. You can just grab two opposite corners of the paper. And if you had like an expansion rod to pull them apart, the whole thing opens up and closes back up really nicely. It, this is a very nice dynamic model. It opens and closes very well. And this is an example of something called a rigid origami model. You could actually make this out of sheet metal with hinges for creases, and it would still do this. It doesn't, even though paper is kind of wiggly, the, pe the uh, this still could, can fold with perfect rigidity, so that all faces of the crease pattern remain rigid as it folds and unfolds. But you can see, the crease pattern is a tessellation. It's just a tiling of the plane. Yeah. And there are lots of other origami models like this. So this is also called the Miura map fold, um, because it works great for maps. Here is a map of the Tokyo subway system <laughs> made out of Miura Ori. And it unfolds and folds so nicely. I wish all maps were made this way. Wouldn't life be so much better? Yeah, but they don't do that. Maybe because it's hard to fold. Here's another origami tessellation that's a little different. Um, this is one that can repeat infinitely towards the center of the paper if you want. It kind of goes farther and farther in, although, of course, you can't fold it infinitely to the center unless you're superhuman and have an infinite amount of time. But it's kind of amazing that there are origami models that do have that property of just like kind of tessellating towards the center of the paper as opposed to going on forever in like the x and y directions. Uh, one last example, this is an example of a 3D origami tessellation. Um, this one is, has interesting applications to architecture because what this object is in this, in this folded state is something called an octahedron tetrahedron truss. If you were to go to a sports arena and look at the ceiling and try to see like what um, metal strut system is holding the ceiling up, there's a good chance it'll be an octa octahedron tetrahedron truss, otherwise known as an octet truss structure. It's a way of tiling uh, pyramids and things called octahedra together in a 3D lattice that's very strong. And it turns out you can actually fold one of these, too. This one folds and unfolds as well. So I'm going to try to find two nice places to fold and unfold it. So this is very mathematical. The only reason why this works is because of the nice interplay of the angles and what the paper is doing and uh, making the paper go from a flat plane to a part of uh, you know a 3D object thing where it's actually making tetrahedra and octahedra cells. There aren't very many models like this. This is really a special one. And uh, some of the, the I've been working with some physicists at the University of Massachusetts and at Cornell University to study this and see how easy it is to make these kind of folded structures in really really tiny materials so that maybe they can be put to use in like uh, biomedicine or um, or who knows, maybe making uh, nanoscale robot mechanisms. Because if you can make something like something m mimic the mechanical process of this, maybe you could actually design a little tiny origami robot. Who knows? That's one of the reasons origami has been very interesting to scientists. People are beginning to think of interesting applications for amazing structures that fold up in intricate and interesting ways. And that's what my talk 
here at the Carriage House at the Mathematical Association is about. And if you want to see that, watch the longer version of the whole talk. <laughs> but thanks for your attention.